Welcome to this conversation, which is organized on behalf of USU's Teach-In on Racial Justice. I'm thrilled to moderate today's conversation with Dr. Patrick Mason on racial inequality in religion. Dr. Mason is an American religious historian and the Leonard J. Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture at USU. So thank you, Patrick, for participating in this event and for sharing your wisdom and insight and expertise in this really important and unique historical moment when our country is confronting anew its history of systemic racism. So I'd like to just dive in. I'd like to begin by asking you about the relationship between religion and race. Uh, we usually think of these as discrete categories, both in terms of history and in terms of people's identities. But you and your work suggest that in reality, religion and race have always been closely linked in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. And, and first of all, thanks for the opportunity. This is such so um, important for us to address these topics uh, right now. But be right, you know, if for, for me as an American historian, when I think about uh, religion and race, I go way back to the very beginning of of what we think about is especially the, the, the European uh, prehistory of, of what becomes the United States with European settlement and colonization here. And it goes, you know, last year, uh, 2019 was the 400th anniversary of when the first Africans were brought to this continent um, and uh, involuntarily, uh, of course. And from the very beginning, so for 400 years now, uh, race and religion have been intertwined because at that time in the 17th century, the idea of, of what we now call whiteness, um, but then also Christianity and civilization, they were all wrapped up together. So the idea that was that, you know, at least among Europeans, they believed, of course, that, that they had reached the, the pinnacle of civilization, which was connected closely, especially for the English, with Protestantism, uh, and also with what it meant to be English or what, what we would eventually call, you know, being, being white. And so to be outside of Christianity was to be outside of civilization. So this is why these references of Africans or of the indigenous peoples of this continent, they were, they were savages and mm -hmm. heathens. Uh, it wasn't just their, you know, their level of technology, um, but it was, it was the fact that they were outside the bounds of what God had graced as civilization. And so from the very beginning, uh, as slavery develops in this country in the 17th century, you get a really close relationship between the emergence of what we now call race and religion. So for instance, in, in Europe, in, in European Christianity, it was illegal to enslave another Christian. Uh, that, is, that had been something that had been developed over Christianity over, over the previous century. So, so when the British came here, it was illegal to enslave another Christian. Well, of course, when they brought Africans to this continent, most of those Africans were either Muslim or they practiced traditional African religions. But a few of them, once they got here, there were a few preachers kind of traipsing around the colonies, you know, and they would preach to, to the slaves or, or in other ways they would encounter Christianity. And a few of those early uh, African uh, uh, indentured servants or, or slaves, they would convert to Christianity. And this raised a real question. You know, the law says that you can't enslave a Christian. So what, what do they do? They change the law. And in 1667, Virginia passed a statute saying that becoming a Christian did not change your status as an enslaved person. And so from there, from the very beginning, you get this sort of intertwined status of racialized slavery and the religious support for it. It would, it would, it would manifest itself in different ways. They would go to the Bible and find justification for it. Uh, from, from a story in, in Genesis uh, re regarding Noah, the guy with the flood, and, and, and his sons. And so the, the idea is that, that the Africans were descended from one of his sons who had been cursed. It's called the curse of Ham. Um, and, and when Christian preachers went around to the plantations and went around to uh, the enslaved Africans, uh, they would preach from the Bible, but they, it was very selective. They would only preach a message of slaves obey your masters. And, and there's some language, uh, both uh, in the Old Testament and New Testament along those lines. And so they use Christianity as a prop 
for this new race-based uh, system of, of slavery in America. That, that's really fascinating. And race-based slavery has often been called America's original sin. And you've mentioned how Christianity was implicated in the origin origins of American slavery. What did that look like as slavery evolved and developed, particularly in the decades before the Civil War? Yeah, so of course, as we know, I mean, slavery becomes more and more important in the early history of this country, especially in the South. It begins to, it begins to regionalize, and especially by the time we get to the 19th century, it's not a, um, a particularly viable economic system in the North, and so it becomes localized in, in the South, but this is where the Southern states really hold on to it. And in order to, to justify it, uh, it was also the 19th century was a period of real religious revival in early America. Uh, we call it the Second Great Awakening. So the South was this deeply religious place and then a, a region that was deeply committed to slavery. And those two things began to merge hand in hand. And whereas at the same time, the North was also a very religious society. And so the people who were opposed to slavery also began to marshal religious ideas uh, on, on their side. And so you've got Northern Christians using the Bible to critique slavery. You've got Southern Christians using the Bible to support slavery. And of course, they're, they're choosing different passages or different stories, but the Bible's a big enough book that you can find almost anything you want in there. And this is what um, uh, one professor has called the ambivalence of the sacred, the idea that religious ideas and texts and leaders can actually support a wide range of different things. So you can't just say Christianity says X or Islam says Y, because actually within those religious traditions, there's a wide variety of views. And so this is what you had, is you had Southern slaveholders pointing to the Bible, finding passages and saying, this justifies our enslavement of African human beings. Whereas abolitionists, think about John Brown, right? Who's a deeply right. religious man. Um, he is equally using the Bible to critique slavery. and so. So this actually became kind of a moral crisis for Christianity because the, you know, Christians believed that the Bible could solve all of society's problems, that the Bible had all the answers. Well, guess what? The Bible was giving different answers on this question of slavery. People, you know, good Christians in the North and in the South were coming up with different answers on this. So this actually eroded the authority of the Bible and of Christianity in America until you get you know, a figure like Malcolm X in the 20th century who says Christianity is the white man's religion. Why? Because, well, Christianity had been used to, to support not only slavery, but also you know, um, ra the racial inferiority of, of Africans and other people of color. And so, uh, so you, know, you have this deeply ambivalent legacy of Christianity's relationship to racial justice during, during the slavery period. That's fascinating. And it also speaks to really important really important role of kind of historical context in understanding the role of religion or religious texts in shaping social action, I guess. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Malcolm X and, and, and this kind of paradoxical role of, of Christianity during this period of, of, of uh, American history. Often when we talk about religion as a means of empowering or liberating people of color, Martin Luther King Jr. comes to mind. Yeah, exactly. And so that's the thing. Re religion's always, it's, there's always been two sides of the story. And so when you think about Martin Luther King, before he was a civil rights leader, before he was leading marches, before he was giving, you know, uh, you know the I have a dream speech, uh, you know, he was a pastor. He, he went to seminary. He, he was, you know, the, the reason he went to, to Alabama was he got hired uh, uh, as a pastor of a church. And, and so he, um, and he grew up in a church family. His father was, was a pastor. And so he, deeply religious. And, and this really speaks to the importance of the black church. So, you know, if we, if we talk about slavery as being America's original sin, uh, and even uh, Joe Biden recently uh, used that, that language, if, so if slavery is America's original sin, then, then in my mind, the black church in a lot of ways is America's savior, or at least the savior of America's soul, because it came out of the black church, these powerful ideas about liberation, about empowerment, about the, the dignity of every human being. And, and so what, what African-Americans did is they reclaimed 
the religion for themselves. They said, we're not going to let you define us. We're not going to let you use this religion uh, to, to be a, a system of oppression, that we're actually going to transform this religion and use it as a system for, for liberation. And this becomes really important, not only for African Americans, but for others too, Latin Americans with Latin American liberation theology, with feminist theology, queer theology, where, where people of faith say, we're not just going to let religion be a tool of oppression. We are actually going to transform it and make it a, a, a powerful tool for liberation. That's exactly what King does. It's exactly what the civil rights uh, movement does. When you think about, uh, especially the women, um, you know, a lot of times we focus on, on the male leaders like, like King or Ralph Abernathy or even John Lewis, who recently passed away, right? But the, the, the civil rights movement w was driven by women. And it was driven by women like Rosa Parks and Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer, Diane Nash, and we could go on and on and on. And where did they get their first lessons? Their first lessons in kind of moral vision or organization, you know, movements and all that kind of stuff. They got their first lessons at church. And so the black church, because it was the one institution that African-Americans controlled, um, it was the one place that was their own. And so it is no surprise that the civil rights movement came out of the black church, not only because of its moral vision, but because it was also a place where African-Americans could gather, they could sing, they could preach, they could be together and it provided the networks for them to go out and, and to fight for racial justice. You mentioned the black church. Can you say a little bit more about the the history of, of the black church. So, so leaving off at, at um, you know, slavery and the, and the civil war, um, how did the black church evolve to, 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 to what it became um, as, a, as an important tool for the American civil rights movement? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the, the very first thing that African-Americans do upon emancipation in 1865, well, they do two things. First of all, they reconstitute their families, which of course had been scattered and shattered by the institution of slavery, and then they build churches. And the reason they did that is because, again, during the 19th century, during this period of religious revival, that's when African-Americans um, embraced Christianity in, in large numbers. There had been a few earlier, but this is really in the 19th century in large numbers when, when they do so. And they, um, they found that they were either not welcome in white churches uh, or that the churches were segregated that they were forced to sit you know, on a balcony or at the back of the church. They were not ordained within uh, white churches. And certainly the theology and the messages that they heard in white churches did not speak to their experience and, and uh, was not an empowering message for them. So what did they do? They, they created their own church. I mean, it's, it's, it's this just tremendous story of liberation and, and empowerment and, and, and people taking these, this set of ideas that, that they found to be true, this, this, that the stories in the Bible and, and uh, doing something with it and creating their own spaces. And so that's exactly what they do in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, oftentimes that the most important institution in an African-American community, in a city, a town, you know, whether you're in the South or after the Great Migration in, in cities when they move up to Chicago and Detroit and places in the North, the very first thing they do is, is establish a church. And it becomes, you know, the, the church for African-Americans became a place not just for spiritual teaching and, and a message of otherworldly salvation, although that was important to them too, but it was a place where they found community it was a place where they found dignity, where they were, they were treated um, not like they were out in the workplace or in politics where they'd been disenfranchised and, and, uh, and so forth. But this was a place where they had dignity. And so, you know, it's, um, it, we, we really cannot overestimate the importance of the Black church in helping the African-American community not only survive through the worst of racial injustice, through lynching and Jim Crow and segregation, but also to, to, to give them the, the, the power and the dignity to, to then rise up and demand justice. And they did it out of a moral vision that they cultivated in the church. I'll, I'll paraphrase here, but I believe it was King who said that one of the most segregated places in America is church on Sunday. Um, so, that, so it sounds like the, that, that exclusion of freed slaves after the Civil War um, and the development of the Black church um, uh, that segregation continued well into the 60s and beyond. Um, so it, uh, it sounds like uh, religion has had a really mixed record when we think about the his historical struggle or historical struggles for racial justice in the US. 
what's going on today as we enter into a really contentious or, or as we exist in a really contentious political environment? Um, what role is Christianity playing today? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it continues to be a mixed record. And it, it was a mixed record even in the 1960s, you know, when, when King, so we, we think about the importance of the, of the church uh, in the civil rights movement and the importance of religion, not only Christianity, but you think about like the Nation of Islam and Malcolm X and, 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 and the ways that that, that powered a, a different and, and more radical call uh, for racial justice and black nationalism. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, you had, uh, you know, one of the most famous documents in American history is Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. A uh, beautiful, in incredible, profound. I, I think it's easily one of the top ten documents in, in American history. And but what King does in that, he's responding to a group of white clergymen who say, you know, we we sort of agree with you in principle. Yeah, you know, segregation and lynching they're bad, but you can you slow down, right? You're you're going a little too fast. You're pushing too hard. Can can you just slow down a little bit? And what King says in that letter is he says. He says, you know, obviously I'm not a big fan of segregationists and the Klan and so forth, but at least they show their colors. He says, the people who disappoint me the most, he says, are the white moderates. That the clergymen and, and the church members who go to church and, and profess a kind of Christianity, but who will not stand up uh, for racial justice, will not stand up for human rights. And he said, those are the people who disappoint me most of all. I mean, it's a searing critique. And, and so that kind of mixed legacy continues today. And so you've got um, religious folks who are all over the map when, when it comes to issues of, of human rights, of justice, and, and sometimes, you know, with, with, with deeply informed um, and, and very considered uh, positions uh, on, on certain issues. But, but you also have a lot of people, um, Christianity, unfortunately, has been implicated in white nationalism. Uh, we see a lot of rhetoric, especially in some of the darker places on the internet, about um, and, and and sometimes in in the light of day about America being a white Christian nation. Um, it's still true that that many churches are de facto segregated. None of them are legally or officially segregated, but but still, a lot of religious congregations organize around race. It, it remains a, an organizing principle. Um, so so. So, you know, there's, there's some negative things there, but actually I see a lot of positive things too in, in terms of the way that people of faith, and, and now um, we're not just talking about Christians anymore because especially over the past five, six decades, America has become a much more religiously diverse place, largely because of immigration, immigration from Latin America, immigration from Asia. So now we've got Buddhists and Hindus and, you know, and, and uh, you know, and, and Latin American uh, Catholics and, and Pentecostals and everything. So America is this incredibly diverse place religiously. And so if you, some of the most integrated places in America, now we know that still residential segregation is a thing. We, we know that the way that the race continues to affect business and, and all kinds of things, but some of the most integrated places in America today are Muslim mosques and uh, Pentecostal churches. Uh, and a lot of Catholic churches too that, that, that serve immigrant populations. And so the face of American religion has changed dramatically in the past few decades. And, and so churches actually in a lot of towns and, and cities, they are the engines of racial integration. It's, it's really interesting, really exciting. And then I also, I look at so many faith leaders um, you know, some, a lot of times religious leaders make the news only when there's a big scandal, right? Think about Jerry Falwell Jr., you know, recently with Liberty University. But, but actually, I think some of the most um, powerful voices for racial justice are actually still coming from the church. I think about somebody like Reverend William Barber, who is leading a nationwide poor people's campaign, uh, really sort of inheriting the mantle of Martin Luther King. That's what he was working on when he was killed in 1968. Uh, somebody like Reverend Fatima Saleh, who is a, a graduate of Utah State, who's working on dismantling racism within churches. Somebody like, uh, I got to know a great pastor, a guy named Otis Moss III, who pastors a church in Chicago uh, that has an enormous social justice ministry on the south side of Chicago. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of exciting stuff um, going on there, uh, too. So it, it, it is a mixed record. Uh, but, but I think there's a lot of positive things happening within religious uh, communities right now, too.
I'm encouraged by your hope and, and your mention of, of those folks, William Barber and the Poor People's Campaign has certainly inspired me and I think inspired uh, many who are working, you know, many, many protesters and others who are working for racial justice. So one of our goals with the teaching is to kind of bring these, these larger historical uh, uh, facts and, and larger national context home to Utah to help our community better understand the linkages between some of the national debates and, and what's happening in our own communities. So bringing it closer to home, here we are in Utah, which was settled or colonized by Mormon pioneers. Uh, although, of course, the state's changed a lot over the past century and a half, uh, Latter-day Saints are, are still the majority of the population, including among our student body at Utah State University. So what can you say about the legacy of race within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? How long do you have? <laughs> uh, we can talk a lot about this. Let me, let me, let me talk about a few just just a few things but this is um this is a this is a big conversation it's it's a hard conversation for latter-day saints to have um because like anybody you know people want to think about themselves as as good people right and people want to think about their their tradition and the the heroes that they have you know the mormon pioneers we want to think about them in heroic terms that's that's only natural um but the but but the church does have um a, a mixed and in many ways troubled legacy when it comes to race. Um, but, uh, but, but there's some good things too, and, and, I, and, and there's some hopeful things too. So let's, we can look first at the Book of Mormon, so the distinctive book of scripture uh, held by members of, of the church. So the, the Book of Mormon on the one hand, it has some absolutely beautiful and profound passages uh, speaking to racial equality. Uh, there's this one passage where it says uh, that all are alike unto God, black and white, bond and free, male and female, right? This, this unequivocal statement of absolute equality before God and the fundamental dignity of every single person on this planet. So absolutely beautiful, profound, and I think really gives a foundation for a moral vision. Um, uh, but at the same time, the Book of Mormon has within it, uh, there's a lot of racialization happening. It, it, there are these I won't get into all the details, but there's these, these two main civilizations, the Nephites and the Lamanites, and it, and it depicts the Lamanites as having a dark skin, and it refers in some ways to, 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 to a curse that is placed upon them that, that uh, many readers see as being uh, associated with, with that dark skin. And so um, Latter-day Saints believed, especially in the 19th century, this, this belief has ebbed a little bit. Um, but they believed that those Lamanites were the ancestors of the current indigenous peoples of this, this continent. And so they believed when they, when they met native tribes or when they came here to Utah and met the Utes and the Shoshone and so forth, that they were meeting the, the, the descendants of the Lamanites um, who are described in the Book of Mormon as being filthy and cursed and violent and so forth. And so, uh, but at the same time, the Lamanites in the Book of Mormon have this destiny to, to be part of the redemption of all humanity, that they actually play a really central role uh, in, in the, the kind of um, the, the wrapping up of history uh, in, in the way that the Book of Mormon portrays it. So it's a really mixed record. And that was true when the, the, the pioneers first came here. On the one hand, they, they, they were excited. One of the reasons they chose to come here is because they thought that they could evangelize or missionize among the, the quote unquote Lamanites, uh, among the native peoples. But, you know, for, for Mormon settlers, it was not that much different than any other white settlers in the West. When it came down to it, uh, whatever ideas they had about Lamanite redemption and so forth, it became a competition for scarce resources. It became a competition for land. And so within the first five years of settlement, so the Mormon pioneers come here in 1847, within the first five years, they have used violence to dislocate the Utes from uh, Utah Valley. Uh, they, um, uh, you know, and, and they essentially do the same kinds of things that white settlers do elsewhere. Once those native peoples are dislocated from the valleys where the Mormons want to settle, then they adopt a kind of benevolent policy towards them. But the first few years, um, it looks a lot like settler colonialism that we see in other places in the, in the West. Um, when, when, when the pioneers came, they brought slaves with them. Uh, this is something that, that I think we haven't fully reckoned with. There were three slaves in that original pioneer company uh, that crested the mountains in, in 1847. Brigham Young, earlier in his life, had, had, had uh, 
had statements, you know, espousing racial equality. But by the time they get here to Utah, he adopts really kind of a hard line uh, of, of racial inequality based on some of his own readings of scripture. And so in 1852, he gets up and he announces this ban saying that the people of African descent can't be ordained to the, to the priesthood within Mormonism. And, you know, a lot of times we look back and we say, oh, well, Brigham Young was a culture, was a product of a cult, his culture. He was a man of his time, right? But, you know, there were other church leaders at the exact same time, a guy named Orson Pratt in particular. He was an apostle, a very well-respected figure within Mormonism. He stood up right after Brigham Young made this speech um, uh, and used some, some really, um, some language that let's just say doesn't hold up uh, in the 21st century. Orson Pratt gets up and he challenges Brigham Young, says he's wrong, and essentially uses the kind of language of the Book of Mormon. He says that, that all people are equal before God. And so Orson Pratt was a man of his time too. And so it, it was possible for Brigham Young and the Mormon pioneers to adopt more of a position of racial equality. Look, they're not 21st century people, but still, if you read Orson Pratt's uh, speech, it's a remarkable statement of racial equality and inclusion. But the church went a different way, and it went a different way for 126 years. And, and it's only been in the past few decades with the globalization of the church and, and the opening up of the church that the church has really begun to reckon with this past, a very difficult past, a, a past that, where it excluded a lot of people. Um, and so I remain hopeful because I actually do think that the church is, is heading in, in, in the right direction. I think there's a good trajectory, but there's a very difficult past that Latter-day Saints, um, frankly, have a hard time wrapping their, their minds around. So we, we've still got work to do. That's a, another good example of how the same religious text can be used uh, to, to make the case for competing arguments about exactly. uh, social life, social and political life. So what does that um, reckoning, the, the current reckoning around race look like? And what, and what do you yeah. see moving forward? Well, so to its credit, the, the Institutional Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has started to make some positive steps. They uh, posted an essay on their website, which was informed by really good historical scholarship, where they, they began to wrestle with this history. Uh, in an honest, forthright, and academically responsible way. They did that just in the past few years. It's a really important essay. And they're starting to, to, um, uh, to, 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 to put that uh, kind of historical knowledge within the curriculum that they teach that their young people in seminaries and institutes and so forth. So, so there's a, a lot greater historical awareness. Um, what, what the church, um, and, and, and because it's become increasingly global, there are now more Latter-day Saints outside the United States than inside, and the majority of those are people of color. They're either from Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa or places like the Philippines. And so if, if you look, actually, the average, quote unquote, or, or, or the modal Latter-day Saint now is not a person who looks like me. They, they are a, a black or brown-skinned person from the global south. And so the church leadership, even though they are primarily almost overwhelmingly white themselves, they, uh, they recognize that they're overseeing a global church. And, and I actually think that we're seeing some really positive, you know, it's, it's, it's gradual. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not a tradition given to radical change uh, or sudden change. Um, but, but I actually do see some, some steps to, to recognize what does it mean for, to, for us to no longer just be a, a Utah religion or an American religion, but really a global religion where the majority of our people are, are people of color, right? And, and, and oftentimes poor, right? Uh, and so, so that's, um, I, I think there's, there's some really positive, positive steps there. But what we, where, where we struggle as a people and both at the leadership and at the grassroots level is not only reckon with the past, but, but to have any sense of apology for it. And that's what a lot of, for instance, African-American members of the church want is they want the church to apologize um, in some kind of formal way for it, this previous racial history. And the church hasn't shown any willingness to do that. So it'll be interesting to see that. So I, I, I see a lot of signs of, of progress and, and of increased reconciliation, um, but just how far, how fast, that, that remains an, an open question. That, that certainly seems like a story about the power of representation to change institutions, the power of 
you know, the, the increasing globalization of the church and the increasing representation of people of color to actually move institutions. Perhaps that's a larger lesson for us to, yeah. to learn about institutional change as we, as we think about institutional racism and the potential for change. Yeah, that's right. And so in, in this respect, religious organizations aren't that much different than any other big organization, right? I mean, a lot of the same dynamics are at play. And so just for the very first time in the last couple of years, uh, an apostle of the church, which is the, the, the highest level of leadership, um, uh, one was just called from Brazil. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the first time a kind of non-white, non-American uh, or non-European uh, was called. And, and so I think it's gonna be generational change. It's, it's, it's not gonna be immediate change. Um, and different institutions, different organizations move at a different pace. Um, but I actually see, especially among younger Latter-day Saints, I think that partly this is a generational thing, and we see this in other places in society too, right? But Latter-day Saints who are, say, under the age of 30 or, you know, college age uh, Latter-day Saints, they, they just grew up in a different world than their parents and grandparents did. And they just expect, and because of social media and all the things we're seeing, um, you know, they just expect a different kind of equality and justice in all of the institutions they participate in, whether it be higher education or religion or politics or whatever. So I actually do think it's gonna be this younger generation, both white members of the church and members of the church who, you know, who are black or brown or uh, you know, indigenous uh, members of the church, they're gonna call for greater accountability from their own church. Yeah, that, that's inspiring me as well, whether it's young people in the streets, young people running for office, yeah. or young people in our classrooms. I mean, I think in many ways, they're, they're kind of leading us to a new moral vision, as you, as you called it. Yeah, and it's, so it's exciting, right? So we're all kind of, you know, it's, and, and I actually, um, I, you know, it's for, for, for the church, like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that is, it really is a gerontocracy. I mean, it's led by men, mostly in their 70s and 80s, right, who were formed in a very different time and, 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 and culture than, than what we have now. I actually give them a lot of credit because they're, they're you know, they're forced to change in some ways. It would, it would be easier for them not to do anything, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I actually do see, as, as, as I see the leadership of some of these institutions, we're seeing this in the business community and other places, right, as they begin to listen, you know, that maybe they, they're moving a little faster than they're comfortable with, but, but mm -hmm. they're still moving, right? Yeah, yeah. Patrick, thank you so much um, for these insights. I've learned so much, uh, and I'm sure that your insight will, you know, especially about the historical context, and the way that historical context can inform the current moment, which I think we're all grappling with and, and reckoning with. Um, I think this is so valuable, certainly for me and, and for, for the rest of our community. And you've certainly helped me rethink and maybe recast the role of re religion, both in perpetuating racial injustice, but also as a vehicle for emancipation and liberation. And, and I think that's really the, the complexity of that or the dualism of that is I think really important us. So yeah, I have, I have a poster. I'm looking at it right now on the wall of my office. It's a poster of Malcolm X. And he says, of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward our research, right? That's my <laughs> historian. So That's right fantastic. there. That's <laughs> Brother <great>. Malcolm. <laughs> I, I love that. Well, I'm so grateful and I'm so grateful to have had this time to, to talk with you about these issues. And I'm, I'm really thankful for your insights. Great. Thanks, Christy. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.